questions were, yeah, that's right. remember it's hard to read motives in text. Sometimes a question <clears throat> gives off the impression that you're asking in a spirit of anger, right? So that's the problem with texting these days. Face-to-face -face conversation, you can ascertain whether the person's asking sincerely or asking to challenge you or to put you in your place. Okay, with that said, <clears throat> remember the objections. The Muslim objection went something like this. How can Jesus be God? How can Jesus be God if <clears throat> Jesus depends on God for help, if God appoints him <clears throat> heir of all things, in other words, God apportions to him the inheritance of all things, and God gives him all authority. Now, in the first half, which, thank the Lord Jesus for our dear brother Nehemiah for recording, the first half, you saw how you can take these very specific objections and turn it against Islamic deity to prove that Allah is not God. And he's not. He's not the true God of the Bible, but for other reasons, right? Another objection was, how can Jesus be God if he prays to the Father? Well, lo and behold, according to the Quran and Islamic tradition, Allah himself is busy <coughs> engaging in prayer along with the angels. So every objection they raise against the deity of Christ the Trinity can be turned more forcefully against their religion to falsify it. But falsifying the religion is not enough. You have to then explain your position, right? Or <clears throat> you'll be left arguing the logical fallacy of two uh, koki. You know what the two koki ar argument is? Well, you too. Okay, so Jesus prays. Well, your God prays too. <laughs> well, okay. Where do we go from there? You have to explain your position thoroughly by the grace of the Lord Jesus, by the power of the Holy Spirit. All right, now... Let's address these objections. Number one, there's two reasons why Jesus prays. Two reasons why Jesus prays. First, let's define what prayer is. Prayer is invocation. Prayer is supplication. Prayer is also praise. Prayer is also thanksgiving. Prayer is also communion. Communion, right? So, because we believe in three distinct persons, three eternally distinct persons who coexist eternally as one God, by virtue of being distinct persons, they are in fellowship with one another. They are in communion with one another. They love one another, right? So if you define prayer as communion and fellowship, all three persons of the Godhead pray in that sense. All three persons of the Godhead have <clears throat> fellowship, have communion. They love one another. They speak to one another. They are intimate with one another in a purely spiritual sense. So I would expect that Jesus, who isn't the Father, would be praying to the Father to continue the communion and fellowship he's enjoyed with the Father before creation, and a fellowship that doesn't stop now that he's become flesh. Hold on a second, guys. Okay. Remember, as Trinitarians, now, Maya, are you still recording, right? You still recording? All right. As Trinitarians, we believe in three eternally distinct persons, for lack of a better term, meaning three eternal relationships. The Father, Son, Holy Spirit have intimate communion, fellowship with one another. They love one another, and they are intimate with one another in a spiritual sense. Why would it be shocking to learn that the Lord Jesus would continue his communion and fellowship with the Father while on earth when this is a communion and fellowship that he's enjoyed with the Father from even before creation? 
we're not Unitarians. We don't believe there's a single person within a Godhead. We believe there are three eternal relationships, three distinct persons who've always communed with one another. So prayer isn't simply worship or glorification. It's also communion and fellowship, right? Is everyone with me? Now, if you still confused, if you're still confused, say, put it to and say, look, I still don't get it. So now understand, if prayer means fellowship and communion, fellowship and communion, why would it shock you to discover that the Son is in fellowship and communion with the Father as well as the Spirit, and the Father is in communion with the Son and the Spirit, and the Spirit is in communion with both? That's what we'd expect if it's not a singular person, but three eternal relationships, three distinct persons in perfect, inseparable communion, love, and fellowship. Everyone clear on that? If you're clear, I can move to the next point. No one confused? All right. I'll explain that in a minute. Christian, Chris says, if you ask me a question that takes me off topic from the objection I'm answering, we're going to get nowhere. So if you want, I'll just stop right now and answer your objection. And you'll bring up another objection. I'll stop answering the second objection to answer the third. And on and on we go. I know you're Middle Eastern, and patience is not one of your strong suits. I want you to go to school and become a medical medical doctor so you can have a lots of patience. <laughs> All right. Okay, are we ready? Let's move on. I love it though. I mean I love you. We're all we're all sinners being sanctified and we're learning to just love each other and endure and persevere and have patience because that's what the Lord has called us to. Having patience with me because I can get on your skin under your skin. But isn't it amazing? I'm in the midst of Answering one objection, and someone raises another objection off topic, so I can stop answering that objection, so I can answer this other one. Man, I love that, man. Only in Christianity. You get two Christians and 50 opinions. All right, with that said, if everyone got that first point, let's move on to the second point. Are we ready to move on to the second point? Are we ready? If you're still confused about the first part, the first aspect of my response to Jesus praying, please let me know. Don't feel shy because I want to make sure you get it. That's why I'm here. And then I'll answer other objections when I first thoroughly address one objection. Second aspect of prayer does include worship. Now, why would Jesus worship God the Father if he's God? Because he's also man. In fact, isn't Jesus man as God intended man to be? Didn't Jesus come to the earth to become the perfect man in order to obey God perfectly, in order to do for us what we could not do for ourselves? In other words, God demands perfect obedience to his will. Well, part of his will includes perfectly loving and worshiping him. Since all of us fail that standard, Jesus Christ becomes human to stand in our place to do for us what we could not do for ourselves, in order to fulfill God's demands perfectly, thereby meriting eternal life for us. Did you get that? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say it again, but I want to make sure you get it before I do. Let me repeat it again. Jesus is man as God intended man to be. The perfect man is not an atheist. The perfect man is not an agnostic. The perfect man is not self-centered. The perfect man loves God perfectly, unconditionally, and puts God's interests and will ahead of his own, even if it means having to forfeit his life. When I say man, I'm using the term inclusively. I'm also including women, right? So why would it shock you that Jesus, coming to the earth to become man, becoming a flesh and blood human being, becoming human like us in every sense with the exception of sin, in order to live the perfect human life that we were supposed to, why would it shock you then that the perfect man per perfectly worships the Father? I don't get it. Why would that be a shock? You know, anyone help me out? Should that shock you or should you expect the perfect man Worshipping the Father perfectly, loving the Father perfectly, adoring the Father perfectly. Something that God demands of all human creatures, but none of us can do it because we're fallen and tainted by sin. Therefore, we need the Lord to do it in our place, on our behalf, to then merit eternal life. So let me unpack that a little more, okay? Hope you don't mind. 
according to the law, if you do the law, you will live. If you obey the law of God perfectly, you will live and be rewarded with immortality. Let me show you that. Carol, our sweet sister, Lord bless you as you help us <clears throat> in our discussion. She's still here? Yeah, she's still here. If you don't mind, post for me Romans, I should say, Romans chapter 2, verses 9 to 10. Let me show you why Jesus came to the earth. We know why, to save us, but let me explain how he saved us according to Scripture. Christians emphasize Jesus' death for our salvation. That's only part of the picture. Did you know that Jesus dying for us saves, you, saves us out of hell, but it doesn't give us access to heaven? Are you aware of this? It's not Jesus' death that brings you into heaven. It's his perfect life obedience that brings you into heaven. Did you know that? Jesus' death keeps you out of hell. He died for your sins to save you from hell. But it's not his death on the cross that brings you into heaven. It's his perfect, obedient life. His absolute perfect obedience to God's will that brings you into heaven because God demands perfect righteousness to enter into the kingdom. This is God's demand. God doesn't break his word and doesn't change his mind. That demand must be met. If he says it, it has to be done. So either we do it or Christ does it for us. We can't do it. So we need Christ to do it for us because he's the only one that was able to. You with me there? Is everyone clear? There is an overemphasis, and I don't say this disrespectfully, because you can never overemphasize Jesus' passion on the cross. You can never overemphasize it. But when we discuss salvation, Christians tend to focus a lot more on the death of Christ, but ignore that's only part of the picture. His obedience included being obedient to, the death, to death on the cross. Yes, that's part of what we call his obedience. But that keeps you out of hell. What brings you into heaven is his perfect, obedient life. His life of absolute perfect righteousness. Because by living the perfect, righteous life, he earned, he merited eternal life, not for him. He is life for you. You get it? Now let me prove that. <clears throat> let me show you that. You ready? Romans 2. Romans 2. 9 to 10. Sorry, guys. i got to plug in the computer. All right? Romans 2, 9 to 10. Here. Okay. Romans 2, 9 to 10. Let's read. Yep. You call that in union with him, you've been set apart and are perfect in the sight of God. Yep. Passive obedience, meaning he accepted his faith <clears throat> of dying on the cross something that was done to him, because he didn't nail himself to the cross, he didn't crucify himself on the cross, and his act of obedience. <clears throat> now, Romans 2, 9 and 10, let's read it. So you guys see that this is scriptural teaching. Tribulation and anguish on every soul of man who does evil, of the Jew first and also the Greek. So if, if you desire to do evil, this is your reward. Tribulation, anguish, right? <clears throat> Judgment. But glory and honor and peace to everyone who works what is good, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Did you, did you see it? Here's God's promise to you. If, you. if you do what is good, not try, but you actually do what is good in God's sight, God will give you glory, honor, and peace. But the problem is no one can do what is good. Because we're sinners, held out sinners, who can't help but sin against God and his perfect righteous demands. Now let's look at Romans 2.13. Now everyone's following me, right? Carol, everybody else in the room, you understand this thus far? If any of you any of you happen to be confused, let me know. Nice to see you, Darius. Darius, we're talking about Jesus as the perfect man. Why does he pray to the Father? Watch her, how you doing? All right, Romans 2.13. Read with me. Romans 2.13. For not the hearers of the law are just in the sight of God, but the doers of the law will be justified. See, God cannot lie. He gives his word. And his word is, you do the law, right? you do good, you'll be justified. I'll glorify you. I will honor you and give you peace if you do the law. If you do the law, this is your reward. Let's go to Matthew 5, verses 19 to 20. Let me prove to you that Jesus 
gets you into heaven, not by dying on the cross, but by living the life you were supposed to live. That's why he became man, right? Hope this will bless you in the power of the Holy Spirit for the glory of the Lord. Anyway, Matthew 5, 19 and 20. Even though people identify me with Islam, as you can see, I'm passionate about the doctrines of the faith because it does us no good to know Islam if we don't know our own faith and live it out for the glory of Jesus, right? We need to spend more time in the Word, understanding it, living it for the glory of Jesus, than studying Islam to attack it. And our hope is not to attack it, but to attack it to get Muslims to see the truth of Christ. Anyway, Matthew 5, 19 to 20. Whoever therefore breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches men so, whoever therefore breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches men so, shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. See, here's what Christ is expecting of us disciples. You better put into practice even the least of these commandments and teach others to do likewise. Because if you don't, you'll be called least in the kingdom. Right? But whoever does and teaches them, not only teaches them, but does them, Notice you got to do them, not just teach them, lest you be the hypocrite. He shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Now here's what our Lord says. For I say to you, that unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. You see, this is God's requirement, his standard to enter the kingdom. Do you want to enter the kingdom? <clears throat> your righteousness must exceed the righteousness of even the zealous scribes and Pharisees. Yep, this is not about the law, because the law was God's prescribed way of holiness. Now, how much of the law is still binding on us? That's another topic. I can't get into that right now. That's going to open up a lot of can of worms. Let's just understand that the law was God's righteous standard, his prescribed way of living a life pleasing to him. Okay, but did you catch what he said, Christian princess? Everyone, did you see what he said? Your righteousness has to be greater than than that of the scribes and Pharisees, or you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. He's talking about disciples who want to follow him. So he's making our entrance into the kingdom conditional on having a righteousness that's such that blows the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees out of the water. Now, what kind of righteousness would exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees? You don't need to guess. Our Lord in that same chapter tells us, Matthew 5:48. Watch here. Watch what happens here. Matthew 5, 48. In a few minutes, I may have to put my daughters to sleep, but I'll come right back. Therefore, you shall be perfect. Notice what our Lord did not say. You shall try to be perfect. No, 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 no. You shall be perfect, just as your Father in heaven is perfect. An impossible standard to attain. This righteousness is humanly impossible. So why is God imposing an impossible standard upon us? To show how great His holiness and righteousness is, how wicked we are, and how desperately in need of a Savior we truly happen to be, right? How desperately we need a Savior. That's why. How great is His holiness and righteousness, how pure He is, how wicked we are, how helpless we are, how hopeless we are, and why we desperately need a Savior. That's why God made the standard so high. Now, theoretically, let's say you could, let's say theoretically, attain perfect righteousness. What would God reward you with? If you could attain perfect righteousness, what would your reward be? If you could, which you can't, but what would your reward be? You got it, Eric. Eternal life. You got it, Ryan. So what brings you into heaven? Perfect righteousness. What keeps you out of hell? The debt of your sin being paid. So Jesus saves you out of hell by dying in your place, which you receive by grace through faith. But he brings you into heaven because of his perfect righteousness. Now let me show you that. Romans 5.19. Romans 5.19. Now my hope this is blessing you and you're learning too a little more about biblical theology. To heaven. So now my, don't, don't forget, you don't enter heaven because of the death of Christ. That keeps you out of hell. You went to heaven because of his perfect life of obedience. Yep, exactly, Leon. Glory to God. His righteousness becomes yours by grace through faith. Romans 5, 19. Christians, princes, and everyone else. You see why we need to spend more time in our faith? We get so excited into going to rooms and bashing Islam that we're still ignorant about our faith. Okay, now watch. Romans 5, 19. Read with me, everyone. 
For as by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners. So also by one man's obedience, many will be made righteous. Why are you made righteous? Why are you declared righteous and then made righteous? Because of one man's obedience. That's Romans 5.19. Put it again. Romans 5.19. One more time. So the one man's disobedience, Adam's disobedience, we were all made sinners. We became sinners because we inherited a sinful nature that made it impossible for us not to sin. But by one man's obedience, the obedience of Jesus our Lord, many will be made righteous, declared righteous, and made righteous. Did you catch it? So it's Christ's obedience that results in you becoming righteous and being declared righteous before God. Yeshua and everyone else, you see it? WWE debater, are you seeing this? Stager? You seeing this, guys? But now let's look at Romans 5.18. Yeah, he would say that it's talking about our position. That positionally, if you're in Adam, then you're appointed to die. But if you're in Christ, then you'll be appointed to, to life. However you interpret it, the point is, is the same. That you have to be in Christ to live because of what Christ did. Right? Because if you're not in Christ, then what he did will be of no avail to you. Right, Ryan? Romans 5.18. Romans 5.18, let's read it again. Let's read together. Well, this is Romans 5.18. Therefore, as through one man's offense, judgment came to all men, resulting in condemnation. Even so, through one man's righteous act, this sums up the entire life of Christ, that his entire life was one righteous act, right? Active obedience to the will of God perfectly. His righteous act, the free gift came to all men, resulting in justification of life. So now, just to make sure that everyone's getting it, I don't know if everyone's in the room. Maybe some are in CP's room. Do you see that according to the scriptures, do you see that Jesus saves you from hell by dying for you, but he brings you into heaven by living for you the life you were supposed to live? Yep. When you say us, right? You're not I'm a obedience. Why don't you go to hell? Because Jesus died in my place to save me from hell. He died not to bring you into heaven, but to save you out of hell. And he lived so that you can go to heaven. Is that clear? Got it? Got it? All right. Now let's go to Hebrews 5, 9. We'll read 8 to 9 for the context. Hebrews 5, 8 to 9. I'm answering the question, why would Jesus pray? Because he, became, he came to become the perfect man that you're supposed to be. So the perfect man is not an atheist. The perfect man is not an agnostic. The perfect man is one who perfectly serves, obeys, worships, and loves God. Every second, every minute of his human life. Hebrews 5, 8-9. Hebrews 5, 8-9. Though he was a son, our Lord was a son, yet he learned obedience by the things which he suffered. Notice, he had to learn obedience. Because in his human existence, in his human life, he learned what it's like to be human and endure as a human being and be faithful through human suffering. Something that was new for him when he became human. Right? But now notice verse 9. Amen. This should cause you to love Jesus even more passionately in the power of the Holy Spirit if you understand what he did for us. Now notice verse 9. And having been perfected, having been perfected, did you catch that? He became complete, perfected. He attained the goal of the law. How could Jesus, who's perfect by nature, become perfect? Having been perfected, he became the author of eternal salvation to all who obey him. Did you catch it? When it's talking about him becoming perfect or being perfected, it's talking about his human life, his human experience. His human, human life, his human experience. That as a human being, he starts morally neutral, morally innocent. He's like Adam before the fall. Right? Adam was morally neutral in the sense that he was innocent. He wasn't under the power or dominion of sin, right? But he had the capacity to disobey God and corrupt himself. Now, our Lord, being inseparably united to the Father, could not sin. It was impossible for him. But still, he started with a clean slate in that he was conceived by the Holy Spirit with the human nature that had no sin. 
and by his faithful obedience to his father's will, from conception to the grave, he attained moral human perfection. Right? But to attain moral human perfection, his every thought and desire and action and word had to be flawless in the sight of his father. That in itself should blow your mind away that Jesus for over 33 years, from conception to the grave, from the conception to the grave, had absolutely no sinful desire, inclination, and thought, let alone word or deed. Otherwise, he'd be disqualified from being our Savior. Does that not blow your mind away? How is that possible? But he did it. He did the impossible. Right? Mind blown. I mean, mind boggling. If you really understand what I just said, as the Holy Spirit illuminates you, it will blow your mind away. How is that possible? But he did it. Because if he didn't, we're still in our sins and we're off to hell. Right? So, but by attaining moral human perfection, notice what he earned. Hebrews 5.9. Amen. Blind, may increase your love for him. And may the Lord Jesus bless you for being a soldier, standing up to the giants who oppose our faith. And may the Lord forgive me for offending you. Christ is good. Hebrews 5.9. Watch this. No, no, not overcame death. Watch this. Find the truth. Watch, watch. How, what did he attain? What did he earn by attaining his moral human perfection? Eternal salvation. And having been perfected, he became the author of eternal salvation. Because he's the only one who lived the perfect human life. And he earned eternal salvation. But hold on, he is salvation. He is life. Who did he earn it for? Not for himself. He doesn't need to be saved. He is life itself. He earned it for you who would believe in him, uh, believe in him and obey. So then, why do you go to heaven? Because Jesus earned eternal life for you by living the perfect life that God wanted you to live but you could not why don't you go to hell because he died in your place to pay your debt of sin so you can escape the wrath of God so again a full orb theology says Jesus's death keeps you out of hell but Jesus's life brings you into heaven you see is that clear is there anyone confused or does it help you appreciate the gospel of Jesus Christ more fully by the power of the Holy Spirit? Because everything good is from him. All right. Now, with that said, how could Jesus be the perfect human being if he failed to love God perfectly and worship him? Isn't it part of God's prescribed will to worship him, to fear him, to love him and obey him? So if Jesus is truly human and he's not the father. How could he not pray to the Father, sing to the Father, i.e. worship the Father, when the perfect man <clears throat> has to do all of that in order to be perfect in the sight of God? So to say Jesus can't be God because he worshiped God fails to take into consideration that he also became human to live the human life that God wants us to live. So to be that perfect human being, he has to worship God perfectly and pray to him Otherwise, he's not perfect. How is this an argument against my faith? This is a gross misunderstanding, perversion of my faith. Right? Let me show you John 14.31. John 14.31. See what our Lord himself says. The proof that he loves God perfectly, and the proof that he's loving God perfectly on our behalf, that doesn't mean if he didn't become man, he wouldn't love God. He's been loving the Father even before creation. The proof that he loved God perfectly is that he obeyed him perfectly. Here, John 14, 31. But that the world may know that I love the Father, and as the Father gave me commandments, so I do. Did you catch it? The world may know that I love the Father, and that's why the commands he gives me, I do it. Not I try, I do it. Arise, let us go from here. Right? Right? This is how you know I love my Father. I do His will and I do it perfectly to the delight of His heart, which is why I always please Him. I'm always pleasing to Him 
John 8, 28 to 29. So did that thoroughly answer that objection? Do you see why Jesus as the perfect man would pray and worship the Father? Is that clear? Any problem to our position? Okay. Now you got it, debater. Okay. But now let's look at John 8, 28, 29. Read with me, everyone else. WW, everyone else. John 8, 28, 29. Then Jesus said to them, When you lift up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am He, and that I do nothing of myself. See, I don't do what I want. I don't act on my own initiative. Because the perfect man doesn't do his will but the will of his God but as my father taught me I speak these things and he who sent me is with me the father has not left me alone for I always do those things that please him always not sometime not most of the time always please him because I love him and I delight in him right so to say that Jesus can't be God because he prayed to the Father misunderstands what prayer is and also distorts the fact that we believe that Jesus became man to live the perfect life and be the perfect worshiper of God to then earn salvation for us because God demands all of us to be perfect and our love for him and obedience and none of us can do it on this side of eternity but glory to Christ who did it for us so that now when we enter glory we'll be perfected like him no more sin, no more evil, no more wicked desires, but we will be made like him, morally incorruptible and physically indestructible because of what he did. So we will never ever sin against God after we're glorified. So if that answer that objection. Amen. Pray for them, Ryan. Uh, so anyone confused or was this clear? If you're, if you're confused, put a two. If it makes sense, then I'm going to answer, how is it that the Father could give Jesus all authority and his inheritance? That's the other part. Now, now Maya, are you able to stick around for that part or no? Because that will be it for you then after that. If not, then that's okay. Because he, the argument was Jesus can't be God. Okay, 22 minutes, all right. All right, just give me one minute. One minute, we'll finish it. I'll do it in 22 minutes, Lord willing. 22 minutes is sufficient time by the grace of God's Spirit. And then we'll take a short break, and then later on, Carol, if you want me to do Luke 135, we will. But i got to check up on my daughters real quick. So don't go anywhere. Just give me a minute. Okay, mic test. 
Okay, come get in and go upstairs, girls, and don't be too loud. Okay, glory to Jesus Christ. It made sense to every one of you? You guys understood? That because we cannot live the law perfectly, Christ lived it for us. This is what we call, this is in Protestant terminology, it's called imputation. Actually, double imputation. For those of you who may not know what the term means, imputation means to credit something to your account. Credit something to your account. All right? So, for instance, I, I, I perform an action, but I perform that action on your behalf, so you get credited for it. Right? Sorry, guys. Hold on. Sorry. No, I can't find construction paper. Where is the construction paper, sir? I'm sorry, guys. To come help her, please. Apologies. Pray for me. I love these girls, man. I gotta be patient. All right. So I perform an act on your behalf, and you get the credit for it, right? Lack of better term. Right? I perform an action on your behalf, and you get the credit for it, right? So Jesus performs this on your behalf, and it's credited to you as if you did it. Make sense to you guys? Right? This is known as imputation. But now, something called W imputation. What does that mean? You sin, and Jesus takes the credit for it, which is why he died. How can he who is sinless die? Because your sins were credited to him. It was reckoned as if he's the one who committed those sins. So you sin, and he gets the credit for it, and as a result, he dies. So imagine this transaction, this barter, so to speak. Jesus says, here, you give me your sins, and I will give you my righteousness. And whatever your sins merit, I'll receive. Whatever my righteousness merits, you receive. Right? This is double imputation. Is that clear? Does that make absence in light of these passages of Scripture? Why Jesus would be the perfect God worshiper, because he's not the Father, but sent to be the perfect man, obeying the will of God the Father perfectly, because that's what God expects of all of us, but we fail miserably. And he did it, and he did it absolutely to the heart and delight of the Father, which is why he could not remain dead, because he's not an actual sinner, but the perfect one, the holy one, the righteous one, the living one. I forgot to tell you guys that because of the internet connection is not too strong, I lose connection in three seconds but come back on. Okay. Praise the Lord Jesus. May he protect us and preserve us for his glory. Okay. Let's now answer those other objections because Nehemiah has got to go. Thank our brother Nehemiah for recording this. He's going to put it on YouTube for our benefit to go back and listen to it. And thank Carol, our sister, for posting verses glory to God. All right. Why would Jesus be given all authority in heaven and earth? Matthew 28, 18. Post that for me, Carol. This is easy to answer. It won't take me more than 15 minutes, Lord willing, to do justice to these objections. And then, Lord willing, we'll take a short break, and I'll explain Luke 135 for those of you who want me to continue teaching. Right? Unless you want to go to CP's room, let me know, then I'll shut down. Right? Matthew 28, 18. I'll forgive you for your mistake, sister, but if you do it again, then I'll stone you. Matthew 28, 18. Christian princess. <clears throat> Anyway, let me, I like how you, you know what, sister, you're amazing. Let me tell you why. You again brought up an issue that although has some relevance to the point, but will take me off from addressing this issue, even though Nehemiah has 15 minutes to record this so I can do a thorough job. I don't know, should I kiss you? Should I bounce you? Should I stone you? I don't know what to do with you, Christian princess. What, what do you want me to do, sister? 
Oh, the story of my life. All right. Matthew 28, 18. One more time. Yeah. Keep keep hurting me. Keep stabbing me and say, I'm sorry. Oops, I'm sorry, Sam. Here you go. Oh, I'm sorry, Sam. <laughs> okay, sister. The first 20 times when he stabbed me, I'll say it's an accident. But beyond that point, I mean, come on. Really? Come on. Okay, let's read. Nehemiah, follow me. You there? Matthew 28, 18. And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Now, how in the world could Jesus be God if someone's giving him all authority? Well, number one, the fact that Jesus possesses absolute sovereign authority over the entire creation means that the entire creation is subject to him. Something the Old Testament and even the Quran says is only true of God. So this statement in of itself shows that he must possess the very sovereign power of God Almighty. But how could he possess it if he's a mere creature? He's not. But hold on. Then why was it given to him? Very simple. Jesus came to the earth to be a servant. He relinquished his authority, his privileges, his divine right for a season to assume the status of a servant. So the authority that he's receiving is an authority that he set aside for a season, which now after perfectly accomplishing the will of the Father, he received. It's not an authority he did not have. It's an authority he voluntarily set aside. Let me prove to you that according to Matthew, because they're quoting Matthew, that on earth Jesus functioned as a servant, and as a servant he set aside his divine sovereignty, <clears throat> his divine <clears throat> authority. Matthew 12, 15 to 21, specifically verse 18. Matthew 12, 15 to 21, specifically verse 18. Let's see. Who was Jesus on earth? The Son of God was fully divine, but he also became human. On earth, what status did he assume? The status of a servant, not that of a king. Here, Matthew 12, 15 and 21. Does that make sense to you? Now, my sister, you left me, huh? I like that. You left me. Took a stab, asked me a question, and did a hit and run. Good job, sister. Let's read. But when Jesus knew it, he withdrew from there. And great multitudes followed him, and he healed them all. Yet he warned them not to make him known, now watch this, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, Jesus came to fulfill this Old Testament prophecy by Isaiah, written by inspiration of the Holy Spirit over 700 years before the birth of our Lord. Jesus is the fulfillment of Isaiah 42, 1 of 4. Behold my servant. Do you see that? That is to say, behold my king, behold the God-man, behold my son, or behold my servant whom I have chosen, my beloved in whom my soul is well pleased. I will put my spirit upon him, <clears throat> and he will declare justice to the Gentiles. He will not quarrel, nor cry out, nor will anyone hear his voice in the streets. A bruised reed he will not break, and smoking flax he will not quench, till he sends forth justice to victory, and in his name Gentiles will trust. Ten Again, <clears throat> everyone present, does Matthew clearly <clears throat> teach that Jesus on earth Assumed the status, the role, the position, the function of a servant. Chip Tooth, don't be a puppet for us. Oh, so, TB, tell the coward to come in here and debate. Let's see how well it'll do. Okay. <clears throat> you with me there? Oh, okay, even better. Because I don't want SOB around. But I'll answer. You pretend to be SOTB and we'll see how, how well you do. Okay? Stick around. Don't leave. <clears throat> okay, but anyway, so he was a servant on earth, right? He's a servant on earth. Don't leave because I'm going to debate you now on his behalf. You're, you're going to be his proxy. So why would it shock you that if Jesus is a servant, right, on earth, that later on when he accomplishes God's will perfectly on earth, he's now given authority, not authority he did not have, but an authority he set aside. Why would that shock you? Jesus humbled himself to be a servant, and then the Father, in response, exalts him back to the position he had before he became a servant on earth. Right? Now let's go to Matthew 20, 28. So again, from a Trinitarian perspective, from a Christian perspective, from the perspective of the Bible, when you read it as a whole, from the perspective of the Bible, should it shock you to find that Jesus would receive authority 
when the Bible tells you that he came to the earth to be a servant in status and position, and a servant has no authority but is subject to an authority? Here, Matthew 20, 28. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve. How much clearer could Matthew be, could our Lord be, that I did not come to be served as a king over you. I came to serve you. I came to be a servant. So I can give my life, his life, as a ransom for many. So now, after you accomplish God's will perfectly, why would it shock you that Jesus would then say, all authority has been given to me? Jesus, why would all authority have been given to you? Because I just told you that I came here to be a servant. And being a servant, I set aside my sovereignty for a season. And now the Father gives it to me once again. Be the Son's inheritance. Now, after all, if he's the Son, who would you expect to be the heir? The Father or the Son of the Father? Who would you expect to be the heir? The Father or the Son of the Father? So why, again, would it shock you that according to our scripture, Jesus being the eternal Son, <clears throat> when everything was created, was created for him by virtue of him being the Father's heir? Because all that belongs to the Father belongs to him. Why would that be shocking him? Because I don't understand this. If he's the Son, I'd expect that the Son of the Father, being his firstborn, would be the heir of all creation. Right? Who do you expect the, the heir to be? The Father or the Father's Son? Now let me prove to you that Jesus existed in eternity before creation with the Father and that with the Father and the Spirit, He created everything that exists because everything was created by the Father and the Son and the Spirit together for the Son as an expression of the Father's and the Spirit's love for the Son. Can I prove that to you? Okay, Colossians 1, 16 and 17. Speaking of our Lord Jesus, Colossians 1, 16 and 17. Let me repeat again, Leon, so you follow with me one more time. Why would it shock you that the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit together created the entire creation for the Son as an expression of their love for the Son? Where am I getting this from? Colossians 1, 16 and 17. Leon, read with me. For by him, speaking of the firstborn, the Lord Jesus, all things were created that are heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created through him and for him. Bingo. He is before all things, and in him all things consist. Did you catch it? For by him, the Father and the Spirit, together with the Son, created all things, whether in heaven or on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or personalities or powers, all things, not something, the entire creation, every created thing was created through Jesus, through him, the firstborn son, and for Jesus, and he's before all things, and in him all things consist. Now let me ask you a question. How can Jesus be part of creation when here Paul says, Jesus is, not was, he is before all creation, and he's the one who sustains all creation. He keeps it together. And he's the one that the Father used to make all creation. And it was made for him. How can he be part of that all creation? When he existed before all creation, he was the one that the Father used to make all creation and to make it for him. But if he's not part of all creation, that means he's separate from all creation and therefore is uncreated, therefore he's eternal. Okay, what else do you need? So again, why would it be shocking to find that Jesus, by virtue of being the eternal Son, would be the heir of all creation when sons are the heirs of their fathers? So all that God the Father owns belongs to His beloved Son because the Father and the Spirit who love and adore the Son made everything for the Son. Right? Is that clear? John 16, 15. So the Father appointed the Son to be the heir. In other words, if we can imagine a conversation in eternity, John 16, 15. If we can imagine the conversation in eternity, Son, you, the Spirit, and I together will create all things for you. Why? Because you are the heir, and we love and adore you. 
Yeah, he, he slipped. Remember, blind can't see too good. He meant God, the Son incarnate. That's a typo. Let me, again, let's imagine the conversation again, right? Imagine in, in eternity, the Father says to the Son, Son, you and the Spirit and I are going to create all things for you because you're the heir, and this will be a token, an expression of how much we love and adore you. You understand what happened here? John 16, 15, from the words of the Lord Jesus himself. The words of our Lord himself. John 16, 15, and Nehemiah will be done with this part of the session. It's okay, guys. Don't get distracted. Pay attention to this. Don't let the evil one distract you. Notice the words of our Lord, John 16, 15. All things that the Father has are mine. Right there, bingo. Everything that the Father has is mine. Therefore I said that he, the Holy Spirit, will take of mine and declare it to you. Could Jesus be any clearer that everything the Father possesses is his, his inheritance? Everything the Father owns belongs to the Son? Everything the Father possesses, the Son owns because he is the Son and therefore the heir? So why again would it shock you as a Trinitarian who believes the Bible to discover that the Father appoints the Son as the heir, as the heir after all? Who's going to do the appointing? The son is going to appoint himself or his father? And this is something that was decreed in eternity. Is that clear? If there's anyone confused, put a two. If it's clear as day, then we're going to take a short break because Nehemiah has to go. But Nehemiah, was that clear to you as well? Oops, sorry. Sorry, guys. I don't see who comes in, so let me just remove some. Uh, might have been a while. All right. So, made sense to everyone? No one confused? Okay. Glory to Jesus Christ. All right. Is Nehemiah still here? I didn't see him respond. I thought he was here. Okay, good. So, is that clear? You got all this, right? This is going to be two hours of in depth teaching by the grace of God's Spirit, which, thanks to our brother Nehemiah, will be on YouTube. By tonight or tomorrow, Lord willing, and I'll give you the link. So now, what objection can the Muslim bring to undermine the explicit testimony of our Lord and his apostles and the blessed scriptures that the Holy Spirit produced to undermine the explicit testimony to the deity of Christ? What problem do you have with the eternal Son being appointed the heir of all things? Right? What problem do you have with the eternal son becoming the perfect man to live the perfect life that God expects all human beings to live, a perfect life that entails Christ worshiping and loving the Father perfectly because that's what God demands of all human beings. What's the problem? I don't get it. And as the servant of the Father, would he not voluntarily subject himself and depend on the Father to guide him, to instruct him, to teach him by the Holy Spirit if he's the perfect human servant? After all, which human servant is required and expected <clears throat> to fulfill God's will without depending on God and his Spirit to guide him to do so? So why would this be a problem for the Trinitarian? Absolutely no problem if you know your faith. Now, Maya, you got all that? I'm done. Praise the Lord Jesus Christ. We're done with that session. I hope you got all this. God bless you. Thank you for serving us. Guys, I need to take about a 10-minute break if that's okay. Thank the Lord Jesus, Ryan. You can thank me by praying for me, praying for my family. Pray that we don't shame Christ but glorify Christ in the power of the Holy Spirit by living for him, loving him, loving the brethren, even the enemies of the gospel, but being bold as lions as we do so. Right? Christ is risen, risen indeed. Okay, guys, let me take a 10-minute break. That means the mic is open. You can come and chat. You can even pray or put a worship song. But if anyone comes up, uh, you know, spewing heresy, I'm going to bounce you.